Hello everybody. Welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at unit 6.4, which is all about heat capacity and calorimetry. So get out your calculators. We're going to be doing some math today. Let's get started. All right, so before we get into the math, there are some vocabulary terms that we're going to bring into our calculations, and it's important that you know what these terms mean on a concept basis. And the first one is called specific heat capacity, which is uh, abbreviated or has a variable of a lowercase c. And if you look at the units, um, that's kind of going to give you an indication of what specific heat capacity is. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat a substance must absorb, or one gram of that substance must absorb, in order to change its temperature by one degree. Okay, so if you imagine like, you know, if any of you have a swimming pool in your background, backyard, how much heat is required to change the temperature of your swimming pool by one degree, okay? Some things require, some materials require a lot of heat to change the temperature. Some don't require much heat at all. Every substance has its own unique specific heat capacity. So it's by definition, the amount of heat required to change one gram of a substance by change its temperature by one degree Celsius or Kelvin, same thing. Okay, same change anyway. All right, and I'm gonna go over that concept again in just a second. There's also something called molar heat capacity. And again, if you look at the units, and compare molar heat capacity to specific heat capacity, they almost are the same except instead of changing the temperature of one gram of the substance, we're changing the temperature of one mole of a substance. Another one you might see, although this would be the one that is the least often used, is something just called heat capacity, not specific heat capacity. It is abbreviated with a capital C, and if you'll notice, the only thing that makes it different from specific heat capacity is that the unit of grams is gone. So it's just joules per degree Celsius or joules per Kelvin. But that one honestly does not come up very often, okay? All of these are intensive properties. That means that uh, whatever a substance's specific heat capacity, for example, it doesn't matter how much of that substance I have. A, a substance's specific heat capacity is going to be intensive. It's independent of the amount. So let's look at this concept of specific heat capacity in a little bit more detail and make sure you have the concept down. So the question says, what if the same amount of heat were applied to the same mass of gold and silver? Which one would show the greatest change in temperature? And then I've given you each element's specific heat capacity value, okay? And they're close, but they're not the same. Silver has a higher specific heat capacity than gold does. So let's, we've already defined it, but let's, let's kind of say it in a different way. I can see that silver's value is higher. That means silver can absorb more heat before we change its temperature by one degree, okay? In other words, I'll say it to you in another way. Silver is the element that is more difficult to change its temperature, okay? Silver requires more heat to change its temperature. Gold does not require as much heat to change its temperature by one degree. So if I'm applying the same amount of heat to both of these and they have the same mass, which one is gonna heat up 
quicker, okay, which one is going to have the greater change in temperature? Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you predicted correctly. That is going to be gold, okay, because gold does not require as much heat to change its temperature. Okay, so let me give you another, another substance that's not on the screen in front of you. Water has a specific heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now that is a number much higher than those two in front of you. It is difficult to get water's, water's temperature to change by one degree. It requires much more heat than these metals. All right, and think about it, that should make sense to you. Metals are good conductors, okay? Metals conduct heat very well. If you've ever, you know, worked with a pot on the stove that has a metal handle and the pot's been on the stove for a while, that handle gets pretty hot. Metals absorb heat relatively quickly and the temperature of a metal changes relatively easily, whereas water doesn't so much. Why? Because it has a higher specific heat capacity value. Okay, now we've mentioned this before, the first law of thermodynamics, that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted from one form to another. So we're going to see a lot today of situations where something is losing heat and that heat that is being released or lost is gained by something else. And we've actually already talked about that a little bit, about how, for example, an exothermic reaction, the system releases heat and that heat is absorbed by the surroundings. So we've actually already talked about this concept, but we're going to put it into more concrete situations. For example, if you look at the situation in this picture here, you have a, a sample of a, some metal and it's very hot. It's 100 degrees Celsius, that's hot. And you put it into a cup of room temperature water. I want you guys to just think about the situation here. Which one of these substances is going to cool down? The metal, right? The metal is gonna cool down. What's going to happen to the temperature of the water? The water is going to heat up. Which part of this scenario is releasing heat? The metal. The metal is losing heat, whereas the water is gaining it. Okay, and there's a, a variable you're going to see a lot today. Lowercase q is a variable that means heat, heat energy. The heat lost by one part, okay, let's say metal, is going to be equal to the heat gained by the water. Okay, so I just wanted you to understand that concept before we apply some math to it. So what math are we going to apply? Well, there is a formula that is on your equation sheet. You may have seen it before from Chem 1. We call it the MCAT equation, even though that's not really an A. Okay, but Q is heat, M is mass, C, lowercase c, is specific heat capacity, and delta T is the change in temperature. And we always do final minus initial. And sometimes, guys, you'll have questions, and I'm gonna, you're gonna do some examples in just a minute, that are really, really simple, where you're doing nothing more than plugging values into that equation. Done. Sometimes, however, you're gonna be having situations kind of like this picture in front of you, where you're looking at two different parts of this scenario, and you have to account for the heat lost and gained in, in the whole scenario. So what I would do, I would use this MCAT equation twice. So let me write this again. The heat lost 
by the metal, now watch, I'm going to change this just a little bit, is equal but opposite in sign to the heat gained by the water. Now let me explain why I put that negative in there. Okay. Remember what we said, I think it was two units ago, maybe even three. Energy released. The, the metal's going to lose energy. That is exothermic, ladies and gentlemen. Remember that exothermic heats are negative, okay? So the heat on the left side of the equal sign is gonna be a negative number. Heat gained by the water, that's heat gained, that's endothermic. Endothermic heats are positive. Positive. How do you make something negative equal something positive if they have the same quantity? by throwing a little negative sign in there. Now those numbers will work out, okay? So really what we should say is heat lost is equal but opposite in sign to the heat gained. Now mathematically, what would that look like in this situation with the metal in the water? I would do two MCATs, one on each side, I would do the mass of the metal times the specific heat capacity of the metal times the change in temperature of the metal. Again, we always do final minus initial, okay? Even if that gives you a negative number, that's okay. Is equal but opposite in sign to the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water times its delta T. Okay, and what you would, in a problem like this, one of these variables would be the unknown. Okay, you would have multiple values given to you and something in this equation here would be unknown to you. All right, so what I want you to do is try this problem, okay? I'll introduce it to you and you're gonna try it on your own, all right? It says a 27 gram sample of an unknown metal was heated until 420 joules of heat had been added. The graph to the right shows the data collected during the experiment, okay? And we can see that time is on the X, temperature is on the Y. Letter A says, determine the temperature change of the metal. Okay, final minus initial. And that should say letter B, it's a second letter A. It says, determine the specific heat capacity of the metal. Include units in your answer. Okay, before you get going, keep in mind this is simpler than that situation we were just looking at. Okay, we just are looking at a sample of metal. That's all. Okay, we don't have we don't have water in the mix as well. It's just a sample of metal. So pause the video, see how you do with this. All right, let's see how you did. So the first part says determine the temperature change of the metal, and that's nice and simple. That's just final minus initial, and that's coming from the values off of the graph. It looks to me like the temperature of the metal ends up right around 60 degrees and it looks to me like it started right at about 20 degrees. So my delta T is going to be 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, so there's my first answer. Then the next part says determine the specific heat capacity of the metal. Well guys, I'm gonna write this up at the top of the slide. This is the only equation we know that involves specific heat capacity. And this question is actually simpler than the sort of example situation I did talked about on the previous slide. There's no water here. It's just the metal. And let's look at the pieces I can fill in here. 
I am given a heat value, I know the mass, and I just calculated the delta T, so specific heat capacity is my unknown. So let's plug everything in. I don't know what the specific heat capacity is. Okay, so I do the math and I'm gonna round to two significant figures because of that number. So that gives me 0 0.39. And if you go back and look at your notes or the previous slides, here are my units. Joules per gram degree Celsius, final answer. Okay, so that was a nice simple one because you didn't have multiple, you know, things to deal with. It was just that metal. All right, but I want you to look at another one. Now this one is very similar to what that situation two slides back with the hot metal and the cool water. So let's look at this one. It says a 46.2 gram sample of copper is heated to 95.4 degrees, so it's hot. And then it's placed in a calorimeter. Okay, that just means a cup of water. We're gonna take, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, what a calorimeter is. Containing 75 grams of water at 19.6 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of both the water and the copper is 21.8 degrees Celsius. Remember guys, from a previous lesson, that's called thermal equilibrium where both have reached the same temperature. Final question, what is the specific heat of copper? I want you guys to think about the situation I set up for you two slides back. Pause the video, see if you can solve this. All right, let's see how you did. Now, before I put up the answer, if any of you were thinking, you know, wait a second, there seems to be a missing piece of information, what is the specific heat capacity for water? That's a number that I would highly recommend that you commit to memory. The specific heat capacity for water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And so assuming that you have that number in your mind, there should be only one unknown. So let's, let me pull up my work here. So I started off saying the heat of the copper, the heat, the copper is going to lose heat. The heat lost by the copper will be equal but opposite in sign to the heat gained by the water. And in my calculations, I did two MCAT equations, two MC delta T's. The one on the left is for the copper. The one on the right is for the water. Okay, but it, notice in both situations, in the delta T's, I always do final minus initial. Okay, even if that gives me a negative number, like right there, and it should, the copper is cooling down. Okay, so I should get a negative number. And so my final answer for the specific heat capacity is 0.203 please make sure to always include appropriate units. Okay, now we're gonna continue this concept of heat released is equal but opposite in sign to heat absorbed. And you saw that question mentioned the word calorimeter, okay? Guys, a calorimeter is just a device used to measure heat changes. Okay. For example, this is a what's called, and I didn't, I'm not making this up. It's literally called a coffee cup calorimeter because it's made of styrofoam. Typically, why styrofoam? Well, styrofoam is an excellent insulator, meaning it does not allow much heat transfer from inside the cup to the surroundings outside the cup. This is why, you know, styrofoam cups are used a lot for like hot cocoa and things like that because it keeps the cocoa nice and warm. It doesn't allow much heat to transfer through that material. But you'll notice that inside the styrofoam, we've got 
um, something that can stir the solution, whatever's going on in there. And we have a temperature uh, measuring device, a thermometer, okay? And looking at changes in the temperature is gonna give us indications of what's going on inside that calorimeter. So I have a multi-step problem here, and I'm gonna work this one through with you, okay? It has multiple steps, but we're gonna talk out each step. So I see I've got a sample of uh, a data table, and next to it, it says a salt was dissolved in a sample of water and the temperature was measured. Use the data in the table to answer the following questions. So it, it appears that I've got the mass of the calorimeter, like the cup itself, the mass of the calorimeter and the water that's been poured inside the cup, and then I've dissolved a salt in there. And I can see that from before I dissolved the salt to after, the temperature has gone up, okay? And guys, that happens. Sometimes you, we don't typically think about, you know, dissolving things, causing there to be a heat change, but some salts do make the temperature go up or down, right? So let's look at the first question. This is a little bit of review. It says, is the dissolving process exothermic or endothermic, justify using only the data, okay? And guys, for each of these questions, if you wanna try them on your own, you can always just pause the video and then just wait to see if you got the answer right. But I'm just gonna talk straight through it. So I'm gonna say that this is an exothermic process. Why? Because there's a rise in temperature. It gets hotter. Remember guys, I'm going to say this multiple times in this unit, a temp the thermometer is part of the surroundings. So if the temperature is going up, that indicates that heat has flowed from the system, the system being the salt dissolving, into the surroundings. The water, guys, believe it or not, is actually part of the surroundings as well. So this is an exothermic process. Okay, part B says calculate the mass of the solution used. Solution includes both the salt and the water together. So I'm going to subtract the mass of the calorimeter, water, and salt minus just the mass of the calorimeter. That gives me 50.23 grams of the solution. Okay, next part says determine the change in temperature, nice and easy. Again, always do final minus initial, and that gives me a temperature change of 16.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, next part says calculate the moles of calcium chloride, that must be the salt, that have been dissolved. Okay, so the first thing I've got to do, guys, is I've got to figure out what is the mass of the salt. Okay, so I subtract two numbers from the data table. I get 4.97 grams of the salt. And then I use the molar mass off the periodic table to convert it into moles. Okay, so we're just kind of going through step by step and this next part, this is the last part and this is sort of the most important part. It says calculate the molar, that's important, molar heat of solution. Okay, so I want to come up with a final number that tells me what is the heat change involved in this process of dissolving calcium chloride in water. And then it says, you may assume the specific heat capacity of the solution is 4.18, okay? Now guys, this is a similar situation that we've been seeing here. The heat of the solution, and we determined that that would be exothermic. So the heat of the solution, the heat lost by the solution, the heat released by the solution, where is it going? into the surroundings. The heat lost by the solution will be equal but 
opposite in sign to the heat gained by the surroundings. So look at what I've written here. Okay, heat of solution is equal but opposite in sign to the heat gained by the surroundings. Well, I only have numbers for the surroundings, okay? All I have is the mass of the solution. I have the specific heat capacity of the solution and I have the temperature change. But guys, remember, temperature change is a measure of the surroundings, okay? And my answer comes out to be negative because there was that negative sign there. Now, again, focus on the units that they have asked us to give the answer in. Right now, my answer is just in joules. And if you're, if you're you know, concerned at all about, well, how would I know that that's in joules? Look at the units that cancel out here. Grams cancel out because that grams right there, that's in the denominator. Degrees Celsius also cancels because that's also in the denominator, so what am I left with? Just joules. And that's not what they want. They want joules per, per means divided by, joules per mole. Well, I calculated the moles of solution earlier, so all I have to do is divide them. So there is my final answer, okay? Now, let me just say one final thing before we wrap up here. Okay, this particular problem had us calculating the heat of a solution, meaning the heat change involved in dissolving something in something else. But ladies and gentlemen, I could have done this exact same process, except changed one word right here. Instead of saying, calculate the heat of solution, Sometimes you'll see problems that will say, calculate the heat of reaction. Meaning instead of just dissolving a salt in water, maybe you're carrying out some kind of chemical reaction in a styrofoam cup, okay? And as we've talked about, some reactions are very exothermic, some are very endo. When you carry out chemical reactions, sometimes you see a temperature change that would not change anything except for these words right here. I would do the exact same process. So don't get nervous if you see a question where there's a chemical reaction going on inside of a calorimeter, you're going to do the exact same processes, okay? So sometimes you're just dissolving a salt, sometimes you're carrying out a chemical reaction, same process. So I know that was a lot, okay? And that's not, it's not the easiest concept to wrap your brain around. Um, and one of the, the, the two most commonly missed things in, in this unit are appropriate units in your answer and also signage, meaning like, should your answer be negative or should your answer be positive? Like that question we just finished up, our final answer, if you notice, was negative. And that matches what we saw in the first part of that problem. The first part of that problem, we saw what, that the reaction, the, the solution process, the dissolving process was exothermic. So our final answer being negative actually matches, matches that. So signage is really important. Units are really important. Um, but I do understand that they are difficult. Um, so we will get some more practice with this in subsequent units. But I hope you learned a little something today and I look forward to seeing you next time.